Hi everyone, my name is Daily Naughton and welcome back to my channel. So I've got a bit of a different setup today. I'm also attempting to record my audio onto my computer using this lapel mic. Um, so hopefully things are a lot less echoey and a bit more consistent across the board, but I also could have messed it all up and not be recording at all right now or that the recorded audio is even worse quality, which in that case, this will just become like a really cute accessory that I'm sure will be in ne next month's Vogue as a trend to watch out for. Anyway, so this week's video was actually supposed to be a really fun little writing vlog where I just took you along for a day in my life of getting some work done on my story. So that was the plan for this week. And then I was on Twitter last night, <laughs> which whenever I have a sudden mood shift, it can always be prefaced by, I was on Twitter. I saw a tweet from another writer, um, published, traditionally published writer. And the gist of the tweet was that you should go back through your manuscript and delete every time you use one of these words. And it proceeded to list a number of words, suddenly, always, that, things like that. Um, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Delete it. But basically, I was very curious to see what the responses were by that because I definitely had an initial response to it. So I clicked and I read through the replies and basically there were people that were adamantly agreeing with what the original tweet said and there were those that were adamantly disagreeing with what the original tweet said. And both sides thought that they were 100% right. And I think this brings up a really interesting discussion um, in the writing world, especially in the online writing world where there's so much talk of craft and sharing tips and tricks. And that discussion is revolving around the rules of craft, the rules of writing. As someone who got an undergraduate degree in creative writing and then went on to get a master's degree in creative writing, I have obviously studied the craft of writing and I've obviously been taught these rules in an academic and non-academic settings. By rules, I mean, and if you're a writer, you've heard these, I mean things like no dialogue tags except for said, never use adverbs, show don't tell, no run-ons, things like that. These, these rules of craft that you are meant to adhere to and that is what makes good writing. At least you're told that that's what makes <laughs> good writing. So I've done a lot of thinking on craft and the rules of craft and I've come up with a bit of a philosophy about it all that I'll share with you now. My philosophy when it comes to the rules of writing is that the rules of writing are tools you are given to build up your craft. And I like to envision this as a tower. So you take these rules that you're taught and you build up this tower and you build it up strong and resilient so that it can withstand the winds of critique and, and self-doubt and all these things that threaten to topple it over. Your tower is strong and can withstand all that. And when you get it to that point, you tear the bitch down. <laughs> brick by brick, you tear it down with your bare hands until you're left with nothing but a pile of rubble. And then within that rubble is where you find your voice, your writing. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. What is one of the first rules of writing you learn as a child? At least for me, when I was much younger, it was said is dead, right? Everyone has heard this, said is dead and you're taught to never use said. I know, at least in my education, and this was when I was in elementary school, middle school, but if you used said in a piece of creative writing assigned to you in English, the teacher would circle it, said is dead, you'd lose points for it. So basically, you started avoiding the word said like a plague. You would come up with any other dialogue tag you could possibly think of. And this did a few things. It helped you develop your understanding of human emotion and the way humans express themselves. It also asked you to think more deeply about your character's emotions in that scene. How are they saying this line? Are they screaming it? Are they murmuring it? You know, are they, <laughs> are they sobbing it? How are they expressing themselves in this scene? So you get to a point where you feel so good. You're like, said is dead, I'm never using said again. And then you get to a certain point in your education and the script flips. All all of a sudden, the rule is never use a dialogue tag except for said because it pulls your reader out of the story. So now said is all you used. Great, you've got the next rule down. You've got that down pat, you've adjusted, you've come around, said was dead, and now said is alive again. Surprise, bitch. I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. 
fine, whatever, I'm just doing what I'm taught. So eventually, after education, after you learn all these rules of the craft, all the rules of writing, you get to a point where your craft is pristine. All the rules are followed. You don't have any suddenlies in your pieces, no adverbs, you only use said as the dialogue tag, no run-ons, you have one short sentence, then a long sentence, then a short sentence, then a long sentence, so you have varied length. And guess what? You have on your hands a perfectly crafted piece of crap. It's boring. It is just like everything that anyone who has a copy of Stephen King's On Writing on their shelf would write. There's no you in it. There's no individualism. There's no life in this piece of writing because it was all about following the rules of craft, not telling a story. This is the moment that you tear it all down. Stephen King said no adverb. Fuck it, I love an adverb. This scene needs an adverb. And I, I love the passive voice. When you're using active voice, active voice, active voice, and then there's a line in the passive voice, that means something. That pricks the reader's ear up and makes them pay attention to that moment in the story. It imbues so much more meaning and life into your text. It's interesting because I feel like we are much more accepting of a distorting of form or rules when it comes to poetry, right? We see poets breaking typical rhythms or rhyme schemes. Poets are given so much more license to experiment and be free with their writing and not adhere to these ancient rules. But for a lot of people, prose isn't given the same liberty. The novel, as we understand it, and alongside it, these rules of craft are outdated. So how can we begrudge all these fabulous voices that come in and say, well, these rules don't work for me and this form doesn't work for me and I'm gonna knock it down and mold it into a shape that better suits me. And how can an editor say, oh well, if I word search through your manuscript and you use the word suddenly even once in it, that's an automatic rejection. It's like, congratulations, you've undoubtedly missed out on some of the best pieces of writing you would have been lucky to get your hands on. I just, I think it's so short-sighted and that's why I think it's almost irresponsible to get onto a platform like Twitter and just spew out these wide sweeping rules like you can never use the word that in your manuscript because it's not a one size fits all. Writing is not one size fits all. Writing is art and art should be interesting and experimental and and vivacious. But to prove my point, ooh, ooh, excuse me. To prove my point, sponsored. What if, what if my first sponsorship was a monster sponsorship? Um, probably like my health insurance would go up. <laughs> to prove my point, I've picked out a few examples of prolific, incredible writers who uh, held up their middle finger to the rules of craft. To start with, we're gonna look at James Baldwin, Giovanni's Room. What a writer. Such a tiny book, but like <laughs> so powerful. So much punch packed into this little thing. And one of the rules in writing is don't give away the ending, right? You're not supposed to ever let your reader know what's coming. It's meant to be a surprise. James Baldwin said, nah, I think I'm gonna basically summarize my entire novel within the first chapter. We open up on the novel's protagonist, David, drunk and alone. His wife has just left him. So immediately we know, okay, his wife leaves him. He tells us that he proposed to his wife, that she then had to go to, away to Spain to, to think about her answer, which is when he met Giovanni and began having an affair. All right, that's, you know, <laughs> the good portion of the novel right there. And then finally, this is page five, but not even page five, it's for only, Essentially two pages in, it says, I am too various to be trusted. If this were not so, I would not be alone in this house tonight. Hella would not be on the high seas and Giovanni would not be about to perish sometime between this night and this morning on the guillotine. So in some ways, James Baldwin is challenging his reader. He's challenging the reader to persevere through a book when all the mystery is revealed. You know, there's no will they, won't they when David meets Giovanni because you already know from the first page that they enter into an affair. There's no uh, mystery about whether or not he will make his relationship with Hella work because we know she's on a boat back to America. She's left him. And the final emotional gut punch of the novel that Giovanni is going to be executed. That is given away within the first three pages of the novel. But all of that does nothing to diminish the emotional intensity of reading about those events in detail. If anything, as a reader, 
you have this sick, desperate hope in you that things will turn out differently. You know, as you get to know these characters, they're flawed and they're confused and they're, they're uh, deeply, deeply miserable at points. You, you are just hoping against hope that they get a happy ending. The almost intoxicating element of, of Giovanni's room is that you know there's no hope. You know how it ends, but you hope anyway. That's one example of a fabulous writer not caring about the rules. The next example I have is... Hello. So, uh, different day, different sweater, different hair, different hormonal breakout on my face, but same lapel mic and same video. Hi. Um, if we can all just pretend this is a super seamless transition and that I didn't massively fuck up one section of the video that I filmed last week and ha I'm having to refilm that section now, that'd be great. Anyway, the next rule breaker I want to talk about is Margaret Atwood and specifically what Margaret Atwood does in her novel, Bodily Harm. Bodily Harm is just more evidence to the well-known fact that Margaret Atwood is an incredible writer. Throughout Bodily Harm, there is this theme of the internal versus the external, of something surface level versus something more introspective and probing. And Margaret Atwood reflects and accentuates that theme in the style choices she's made in telling this story. So this theme is seen from the very beginning when our protagonist, Rennie, is describing her job to us. We learn that she once left school with hopes of becoming a really prolific and profound journalist writing about important causes that the world needed to hear about and somehow she fell down this hole into lifestyle reporting. So as she describes it in one part of the book, she writes about the trendy clothing that protesters wear or the interesting foods that these protesters are eating, not the causes that they're protesting. But Rennie's attempts to keep everything surface level and at arm's length is devastated when she's diagnosed with breast cancer and has to undergo surgery to have the tumor removed. Suddenly Rennie is feeling like she's at war with her own body and she's being attacked from within when she always thought the threat was coming from without. Everything in Rennie's life is feeling too raw and too intimate and too close and in order to escape this she accepts what she thinks is just going to be a simple puff piece assignment on a fictional Caribbean island. This <laughs> fun in the sun story turns into something way darker and actually genuinely life-threatening when Rennie becomes embroiled in the political tumult of this fictional island as well as all the deeply personal and messy lives of the people she encounters while she's there. So Atwood tells this story using two different tenses and two different narrative perspectives, which is how she's a rule breaker. You are meant to keep tense and perspective consistent throughout your story. And Margaret Atwood does the exact opposite of that. The very first line of the book is, this is how I got here, says Rennie. There are no quotation marks to distinguish this piece of dialogue, which is a style choice that Atwood keeps up throughout the entire novel. And this in and of itself is playing with the theme of external versus internal and actually making it physical on the page. The words people are speaking versus the private thoughts they're having in their head are completely indistinguishable, the boundaries being blurred. So after that first line, there's a single line break, and then we switch into a first person past tense narration. So it was the day after Jake left, I walked back to the house around five. Throughout the chapter, the narration switches from first person past tense to third person present tense. And then after just a single paragraph of that, it changes to third person past tense. Despite these narration shifts, you as a reader are always left with a sense that this is Rennie telling Rennie's story. She's just choosing to tell parts of it in different ways, or perhaps more accurately, Accurately, she's unable to tell certain parts of it in certain ways. The narration is in present tense during her journey to and her time spent on the island. Any stories from before that time, even immediately before that time, are told in past tense. So Rennie is communicating to the reader a very clear break in time. There's the before and there's the now, and she's telling those two separate parts of her story in two separate ways. Even more interesting than this is that Rennie chooses to tell certain stories from her past in either first person or third person narration. As you read through the book, you as a reader begin to understand Rennie more and more and understand which parts of her life she needs to keep at arm's length. She needs to keep external rather than internal. And she tells those stories in a third person narration as though they're happening to someone else, not to her. Margaret Atwood subverts craft and the rules of craft so, so expertly whenever she does it. But playing with tense and narrative style is not something to undertake lightly. Every Every choice you make has to be so, so intentional because every choice
choice you make will communicate something new to your reader. If it's something you're considering doing yourself, I definitely recommend reading the novels of people who have done it successfully and have used it to accentuate their stories rather than muddling them or making them confusing. And I definitely recommend Bodily Harm by Margaret Atwood for that purpose. Uh, and the last one I'll look at is, is just a fun little one. Um, it's Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. The rule broken is <laughs> no run on sentences. Charles Dickens opens A Tale of Two Cities with probably one of the most op famous opening lines of all time. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of, of comparison only. So there's so many great essays and articles online analyzing this opening sentence uh, far better and more cohesively than I ever could. So if you want to learn more about it, definitely check it out. For my part, I'll just say one, this is arguably one of the most famous opening sentences of all time and it breaks a rule of craft. So point proven. <laughs> win for daily. Secondly, this is a run-on sentence that's full of antitheses and parallels and basically repeating the same notion over and over again that this time was at once the best ever and the worst ever. And because Tale of Two Cities is one of Charles Dickens' only historical fiction novels, I think he's essentially saying that history is told from so many perspectives and even though each perspective thinks that they're offering something unique and groundbreaking to the dialogue, really they're all saying the same stuff, that either it was amazing or it was horrible, um, when in reality the truth is somewhere in the middle. And this theme of parallels of you know dichotomies and antitheses is something that carries on throughout the rest of the novel, which is why this opening introduction to it in such an eye-catching way is, is so important. So those are the three examples I picked out of writers, of famous writers, prolific writers who disregarded the rules of craft. Now, important preface here. This is not to say that you should not learn these rules of craft. I firmly believe that in order to subvert craft, in order to flip it on its head, you must have a very firm understanding of it. So like I said before, that's why I um, am wary and would caution against these great sweeping bits of advice that people offer up on Twitter or on Medium articles. It's why I prefer books on craft like Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. She doesn't have these hard and fast rules that either you follow them and you're a good writer or you don't follow them and you're a bad writer, but she just has philosophies and insights that you can take and mold and apply to your own uh, approach and your own art. I just, like, can everyone just stop trying to tell each other how to write and trying to claim that if you don't write exactly like me or exactly like this published author, then you're a bad writer? That's just not true. If you have a story inside of yourself, you know how to tell that story. And it may take the input of critique partners or editors to come and wave this thing in front of your face and say, look, it's right here, you're just not seeing it. But when everything clicks into place and everything is finalized, it's gonna feel like returning to home. That final draft is, is going to feel like a homecoming because that was always how the story was meant to be told. Not in the way that so-and-so would tell it, not in the way that X, Y, and Z thinks you should tell it, the way that you need to tell it. That is your story. Stop letting other people influence how it comes out and how it takes life. Writing is, is so mercurial and, and intangible and it's something you have to like wrestle out of yourself and throw on the page and be into submission, but that's not something that anyone else can do for you. And it's not something that anyone else can tell you how to do. So just trust your instinct, believe in yourself. The way you wanna tell your story is valid and important. There is no wrong way to tell the story that's inside of you. Oh my God, I've been talking for like 40 minutes. So this will obviously be cut down quite a bit. We'll blame the monster.
sponsored. Thank you so much if you watched and listened to this ramble and be sure if you liked my video to subscribe down below. I'm growing my channel slowly but surely. I have a goal to be in the triple digits of subscribers by 2022 so if you want to help me achieve that I'd be so so appreciative and anyway I'll see you in the next video. Okay bye!